And I'd like to now bring up another interesting place that you're finding descendants of the Israelites. And in America today, you see a, a very large movement of African Americans who say that they're the real chosen people, that they're the children of Israel, they're the Judeans. You know, so what, are they just trying to create a, an identity for themselves because they were slaves? Or is there really something here? And the answer is, most likely there is something there. And most likely, maybe that they were the original Israelites. And maybe that the Jewish people today who are white Caucasian people um, came in a little bit later on. We know they were sold into slavery. We know now that they're fulfilling prophecies by saying, we're coming back, we want to rejoin the nation. We know that some of the greatest sages of the transmission of the Torah were converts from Rome. You have a man named Uncleus who, who wrote a commentary on the Torah, unprecedented, that we still learn today. He was a convert. Some of the largest pillars on the transmission today were Roman converts. So here we are, we're, you know, I'm speaking, we're ca Caucasian Jewish people. And All right. Right now, I'm in the uh, Jewish Almanac um, from 1980. All right, this is the cover right here. It says, A Celebration of Jewish Life and the Jewish People. A fact-filled book. All right, again, a fact-filled book on, of information and entertainment. All right, traditions, history, religion, wisdom, and achievements. Again, the Jewish Almanac. All right, and we go right to uh, part one of this uh, Almanac magazine. Jewish Almanac and it says part one identity crisis it says a brief history of the terms for Jew all right we're gonna get into that all right so I'm zoomed in now all right so you can see clearly and it says here strictly speaking it is incorrect to call an ancient Israelite a Jew all right again strictly speaking it is incorrect to call an ancient Israelite a Jew or to call a contemporary Jew an Israelite, all right? So you can't say that the ancient Israelites are the same as Jews, all right? That's incorrect. And you can't say that modern Jews or contemporary Jews are Israelite or a Hebrew. You can't say they're Hebrew, contemporary Jews, all right? Again, we're in the Jewish Almanac of 1980. So you can't just because somebody's called a Jew, basically what they're saying, that, that doesn't mean that's incorrect to think that they're talking about an Israelite or a Hebrew. The first Hebrews may not have been Jews at all. Again, the first Hebrews, remember, Hebrews may not have been Jews at all. All right, so we're in uh, Online Etymology Dictionary. All right. And we got the word Hebrew here. Just wanted to go ahead and read this before we continue. So what is Hebrew? It says here an adjective, right? It says late Old English from Old French Hebrew, from Latin Hebraeus, from Greek Hebraeus, and Aramaic Semitic Hebraeus, corresponding to Hebrew Ibri, and Israelite, in quotes. Traditionally from an ancestral name Eber. All right, so they get it from Eber. But probably literally, all right, but most likely literally one from the other side one from the other side so if you're in africa or you're in europe and you want to reference an american you're going to say well he's one from the other side right he's on the other side of the ocean perhaps in reference to the river euphrates is this the real ancient Atlant atlantic ocean was it just a river was it a huge river so perhaps simply signifying immigrant all right so look at all the what it all means it says eber also means region on the other or opposite side all right a region on the opposite side so wouldn't america be on the opposite side of europe asia and africa all right america is on the opposite side see hebrew are you a hebrew well if you're on the opposite side of uh, africa and europe meaning if you're in america yeah you're you, you could be you could use hebrew as an adjective all right so we're trying to break this down not trying to say this is a religion or anything just trying to show the etymology because it means something right it, it doesn't just mean a, a, a religion or something like that right so it's a very general term actually as you can see but it means something specifically to somebody being separated all right being separated on or unreachable to certain people all right on another side 
All right, so the first Hebrews may not have been Jews at all. All right, so we're back in the Jewish almanac. All right, now listen to what it says here. It says now Hebrew. All right, again, we just got the etymology online. Now this is there. They're going to break it down, right? In this almanac, it says Hebrew. The word Hebrew or Ibri, right? We, we got that. Occurs in the early narratives of the Pentateuch talk to refer to the in Israelite. All right, so remember what it meant. So in Israelite, when they were saying Hebrew, Ibri, they were saying, yo, he's a migrant. Yo, oh, he's one from the other side. Oh, he's from the region from the other side. So that person is from the other side. When they were referring in Israelite to a Hebrew, meaning this Israel, this person was one from the other side. And migrant of Eber, we got also Eber feather of the feathers of the people who wear feathers. But only in those narratives, such as the Joseph story in Genesis 39, 48 and the Exodus story, Exodus 3, 10, that are set in Egypt, where Israelites are regarded as foreigners. All right, foreigners, ones from another side. Who was calling them Hebrew? All right, and who was the real Egyptians? We can't talk about. We're still talking about American to marry, to marry the mound builders and all that. Little Egypt. It doesn't matter if it was people that were here still. Yeah, not everybody was from the same nation, but we were all here. This is the ancient land. This is the biblical lands up over here. All right. So it says they were foreigners there. All right. So they would be called somebody from another side, right, or another region. Because they're foreigners from that land. So the, an Egyptian would call them an Ibri, a migrant, or one, somebody from the other side, a Hebrew. It says, there, Hebrew is either used by Egyptians to refer to Israelites or by Israelites to refer to themselves in the presence of Egyptians among themselves. The preferred term is Bene Yisrael, children of Israel, or Israelites. You know, another way could be Yasharallah, right? A similar usage of Hebrew is found in the stories of the interaction between Israelites and Philistines in 1 Samuel and the interaction of Abram or Abraham with Canaanites and other non-Israelites in Genesis 14, where the Greek translator renders the term Ivri by a word meaning man of the Jandar region. You see? You see, they're breaking it down again. Ivri. Hebrew, Ibri, a man from a yonder region, from another region, a man from the opposite side, somebody who's not from this land, all right, a man from yonder region. Jonah, likewise, at sea with a crew of non Israelites, refers to himself in the presence as a Hebrew because he's saying, Yo, I'm just a man from the yonder region. You don't know me. I'm from over there, Maraca. All right, remember, Jonah was in the ocean traveling so since the term ivory or ivory is possibly based on the common preposition ever meaning across beyond gender the suffix is an adjective adjectable sorry and then called a gentilic with the sense of it the meaning of the term could have the general sense of genderite oh is really like genderite example for foreigner but since a number of regions in the Middle East are designated by the term Iver or Iver Han Jardin, Transjordan, Iver Har Nahar, Trans Riverdin, example, Trans Euphrates, the term Ivri could just as well designate a dweller of one of these familiar neighboring trans regions, all right? But see, now he's trying to relate it to there, but it doesn't, he's trying to relate it because they have to try because it doesn't. Because they're talking about, like I said earlier, if these Israelites or Hebrews who are being really what it means as people who are from a distant or opposite land they wouldn't be from around these regions right of the middle east so he's letting you know straight up he's trying to explain it in there even though it don't make sense that they could be you know from these also closer regions all right but the truth is you know there is no middle east that's africa or west asia you know and you know biblical lands promised land canaan is right here amaraka canaan land what do, you, what do you mean? Canada? What are you talking about, man? You know? All right, so we're almost done with this. It says, merely regional particularity. Confusion on the matter is compounded by the additional ambiguity and the frame of reference in which the designation Hebrew originated where the Hebrews thought of as those out yonder from the standpoint of Mesopotamians or those from out yonder from the standpoint of Canaanites. You hear that? 
Let me explain what he just said there, what they just said in the Jewish Almanac of 1980. All right, just what I said before. You're getting a, a descriptive term, an adjective, right, for a people, from people who don't really, you know, live with them always or are part of their nations or family. So, like, he's saying, so that's probably a term that the Mesopotamians or the Canaanites were using to call these people Hebrews, meaning those from out yonder, those from the opposite side, one from the other side, a migrant, all right? of the feathers people of the feathers eber means pinion go look at strong's dictionary for eber it goes down to pinion and pinion means feather all right all right so again the jewish almanac of uh, 1980 all right letting you know that strictly speaking it is incorrect to call an ancient israelite a jew or to call a contemporary jew an israelite or a hebrew all right the first Hebrews may not have been Jews at all. All right. Just one more part. So further down it says the Hebrew alphabet was first disseminated by the Canaanite people known as the Phoenicians. All right. You saw my more videos. You know, Canaanites descend from Ham. These are all Phoenicians. We know that it drew Ali said, you know, the ancient Canaanites and Moabites are the Moors. You know, so they would speak a form of Paleo, what they call Paleo Hebrew. And they also called Phoenicians. So telling you the Jewish Almanac right here says the Canaanite people known as the Phoenicians, a group closely related to Israelites linguistically, though not culturally or religiously. All right. All right. Not all king folk are king folk. All right. Not culturally or religiously, but just linguistically. They per the particular form of the Hebrew alphabet used today is actually Syrian or Aramaic in origin, all right? So the one they use today is not really this Paleo-Hebrew, all right, which you find in America today. You find it a lot in America. You found it in the mounds, and you got it in the uh, Lun Lunas Luna Stone in New Mexico, all right? Now it says, Israelite, like Hebrew, right, in parentheses, became common syn synonym for Jew. It became a synonym for Jew. It wasn't always. Remember in the beginning it told us it's not the same. Throughout post-biblical history down to modern times, with perhaps less adaptability to pejorative per usage than the other terms. Since the founding of the state of Israel in 1948, the term has come to jostle against the newer term, Israeli, all right? Which is not synonymous in general. Israeli, all right? It's not synonymous. Israeli and Israelite because Israelite means a biblical follower of the religion of Moses and descendant of Jacob so it's not just a biblical follower but more I mean biblically it's more like the descendants of Jacob right the tribes the 12 tribes and Israelite right Israel they named Jacob Israel it was a title Allah, right it says Israeli means a citizen of the state of Israel it has nothing to do with Israelites or Hebrews and Israeli the term just means you're a citizen of the state of Israel over there in the Middle East whether Jewish and region or not though <laughs> whether you're Jewish and region or not though all right of course most Israelites are Jewish all right Israel it says so I just wanted to break this down a little bit as you can see you know, you got to be careful because they're letting you know straight up their own in their own words. Right. That's two people. Right. We had the rabbi before say that, hey, the Americans, you know, they're saying they're, they're the original Hebrews. And he said, I, I think they are, you know, so he knows something. Obviously, this is from 1980. That video was way after this. So, you know, he studied and they let you know it doesn't mean the same. It doesn't mean that you are an actual uh, Hebrew just because you're called a Jew. All right. Jewish Almanac, 1980. Hello, this is Pastor Stephen Anderson from Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. Today I want to talk about Genesis chapter 10, verses 2 through 5, where the Bible reads, The sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tiras, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Riphath, and Tagarma, and the sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Now, the reason that I read those scriptures to you 
is that they clearly state that Ashkenaz is one of the Gentile nations. Now, 80 to 85 percent of today's so-called Jewry, those who claim to be Jews in the world today, 80 to 85 percent of them are what is known as Ashkenazi Jews. And an Ashkenazi Jew is so named because he primarily descends from this guy in the Bible named Ashkenaz, which is clearly listed as one of the Gentile nations. Now, the reason for this is that there was a nation of people who were of Japheth, you know, who were Europeans, white people, uh, known as the Khazars. And in the eighth century after Christ, the whole nation of the Khazars turned unto Judaism. They converted to the religion of Judaism. And for a few hundred years, the empire of the Khazars was a, a, a power in Eastern Europe and they followed the religion of Judaism. But eventually they were defeated by the Russians and they were scattered into Eastern Europe. And so a lot of the Eastern European Jews today are the descendants of the Khazars. And in fact, DNA testing has even confirmed that the Ashkenazi Jews have about 80% of their genetics and 80% of their ancestry from Europeans. So today's so-called Jews, the Ashkenazis, which again, like I said, is 80 to 85% of so-called Jews in the world today. And it is the primary type of Jew that immigrated into the nation of Israel and Palestine. And it is also the primary type of Jew that uh, is living in the United States today by far. So these Ashkenazi Jews, according to the Bible, are actually Gentiles. And I'm not the one calling them Ashkenazi Jews. They'll even call themselves Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, you could even just go to Wikipedia and just type in Ashkenazi Jews and it will uh, explain these things to you. You can talk to a rabbi and, and you can talk to whoever you want and uh, you'll find out that these Ashkenazi Jews are the descendants of converts. A lot of Christian Zionists today, they claim that these Jews are God's chosen people because of the fact that they descend from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in reality, they don't descend from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob any more than you or I do, okay? They have some blood mixed in from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from intermarrying with other Jews, but so do the rest of us Europeans. Primarily, they are white Europeans. They are not Middle Eastern Jews. And that's why when you look at those in Hollywood today that are so-called Jews, uh, they don't look like Middle Eastern people. They look like white people because they are the descendants of white converts to Judaism, Caucasian converts, Khazars. Uh, that's why they're called Ashkenazi because they're of Japheth. They're primarily descended from the Gentiles. So we just got the pastor. He was letting us know that you know that they descend from the from Ashkenaz, who's from Japheth, right? These Khazars, right? So we're gonna learn a little bit about the Ashkenazi, or at least what we can find, all right, here. But we're gonna read some other things later on. But it says here in this website, it's called thescientist.com, exploring life, inspiring innovation. And it says here, genetic roots of the Ashkenazi Jews. Most Ashkenazi Jews traditionally believed to have descended from the ancient tribes of Israel may in fact be maternally descended from prehistoric Europeans. All right. All right. They're actually Europeans. The majority of Ashkenazi Jews are descended from the prehistoric European women, according to a study published Tuesday, October 8th in Nature Communications. While the Jewish religion began in the Near East and the Ashkenazi Jews were believed to have origins in the early indigenous tribes of this region, new evidence from mitochondrial DNA, which has passed on exclusively from mother to child, suggests that female ancestors of most modern Ashkenazi Jews converted to Judaism in the North Mediterranean around 2,000 years ago and later in West and Central Europe. All right. Again, what? converted so that first rabbi we heard he's letting us know these romans that these famous sages that actually taught the torah these very famous ancient sages that was teaching the torah were actually converted romans to these first uh you know converted jews 
right? They were actually converted to Romans. I right, where this other website says frontiers in genetics, the origins of Ashkenaz, Ashkenazic Jews, and Jiddish. All right, and right here says historical meaning of Ashkenaz. Says Ashkenaz is one of the most disputed biblical place names. It appears in the Hebrew Bible as the name of one of Noah's descendants. All right, that's what he, the guy was talking about earlier through Japheth, right? One of his sons. As a reference to the kingdom of Ashkenaz, prophesied to be called together with Ararat and Minai to wage war against Babylon. Jeremiah 51 27, in addition to tracing Ashkenazi Jews to the ancient Iranian lands of Ashkenaz and uncovering the villages whose names may derive from Ashkenaz, the partial Iranian origin of Ashkenazi Jews inferred by Das et al. in 2003 was further supported by genetic similarity of Ashkenazi Jews to Sephardic Mountain Jews and Iranian Jews, as well as their similarity to Near Eastern populations and simulated native Turkish and Caucasus populations, Caucasus, the Khazars, right? There are good grounds, therefore, for inferring that Jews who considered themselves Ashkenazic, adopted this name and spoke of their lands as Ashkenaz, since they perceived themselves as Iranian origin, that we find varied evidence of the knowledge of Iranian language among Moroccan and Andalusian Jews and Karaites. Are you hear this? It's a big confederacy here. Andalusians, what are you talking about? Huh? thought that was a Moorish town. All right. Karaites. And to the 11th century's compelling point of reference to assess the shared Iranian origins of Sephardic and Ashkenazic Jews. Moreover, Iranian speaking Jews in the Caucasus, the so called Juhudis, and Turkic speaking Jews in the Crimea prior to World War II called themselves Ashkenazism. Ashkenazism? Nazism? Nazism? The Rhineland hypothesis cannot explain why a name that denotes Scythians and was associated with the Near East becomes associated with German lands in the 11th to 13th century. The suggest, uh, Aproot suggested that Jewish immigrants in Europe transferred biblical names onto the regions in which they settled. This is unconvincing. Biblical names were used as place names only when they had similar sound. Not only Germany and Ashkenaz do not share similar sounds, but Germany was already named Germana or Germany. Manja in the Iranian Babylonian Tamur, completed in the 5th century AD, and not surprisingly was associated with Noah's grandson Gomer. Tamut Joma, all right? Noah's grandson Gomer. Gomer from Gomer, all right? You hear this? That's Jafet again. All right, Tamut Joma. Continues as the genetic structure of Ashkenazic Jews. Ashkenazic Jews were localized to modern day Turkey and found to be genetically closest to Turkic Southern Caucasian and Iranian populations, suggesting a common origin in Iranian Ashkenaz lands, descendants of Ashkenaz in the lands of Ashkenaz. These findings were more compatible with an Irano Turco Slavic origin for Ashkenazi Jews and a Slavic origin for Jewish than with the Rhine land hypothesis. So, this is the original. They say, oh, we're just German, you know, that's what it means. Ashkenaz means German, All right? But actually, it's Turkic and, you know, Caucasian and you know, it has a lot of uh, Slavic uh, relations as well. All those areas up here in, 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 in between, almost getting to the Middle East, but actually in Europe still, Eastern Europe, they call. The findings have also highlighted the strong social, culture, and genetic bonds of Ashkenazic and Iranian Judaism and their shared Iranian origins. All right. All right, so now I'm in myjewishlearning.com. Uh, says who are the Ashkenazi Jews all right now it's important what we just read you know how they're trying to say that Reinhardt hypothesis means that they just came from Germany and that's it they had no relation to Iran's or Turkish people or Caucasians people none of that right because they you know you know they want to be linked to ancient Hebrew so going with the whole Turkic and Iranian thing it, it doesn't link them to that so here it says Ashkenazi Jews are the Jewish ethnic identity most readily recognized by North Americans all right so most of the Jews in North America are what Ashkenazi Jews the culture of matzah balls black-hatted Hasidim and Jiddish the ethnicity originated in medieval Germany although strictly speaking all right so now this is what the story goes, right? That origin in Germany, but that was, we just debunked that, right? Through genetics. We just saw the two other websites, right? Although strictly speaking, Ashkenazism refers to Jews of Germany. The term has come to refer more broadly 
Jews from Central and Eastern Europe. All right, it has come. They're learning. There's new information coming out. You can't control the information. All right, genetics is telling people, and there's more information to tell you that it's actually more broadly to Jews from Central and Eastern Europe. Jews first reached the interior of Europe by following trade routes along waterways during the 8th and 9th centuries. Eventually, the vast majority of Ashkenazi Jews relocated to the Polish Commonwealth, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Ukraine, and Belarus. All right, we got that already too, where princes welcomed their skilled and educated workforce. The small pre-existing Polish Jewish communities' customs were displayed by the Ashkenazic prayer order, customs, and Jewish language. All right. We're in the Encyclopedia Britannica, we're telling us that the Ashkenazi people says today Ashkenazism constitute more than 80% of all Jews in the world. All right. Now remember, well, they told us in the Almanac that just because you're a Jew doesn't mean you're an ancient Israelite. It's not synonymous. All right. Remember that. Vastly outnumbered Sephardic Jews. In the early 21st century, Ashkenazic Jews numbered about 11 million. In Israel, the numbers of Ashkenazism and Sephardim are roughly equal, and the chief rabbinate has both as Ashkenazic and a Sephardic chief rabbi on equal footing. All Reform and conservative Jewish congregations belong to the Ashkenazic tradition. All right. But your grandfather was the founding, uh, one of the founding fathers of the state of Israel. Yes, he was. Tell us about this. Yes, he was. The generation of my grandparents uh, was the generation of um, the first Jews to uh, take on Zionism um, as an ideology and um, take on this idea of establishing a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Um, and he was very active. Um, he became a leader within the movement. He was a member of the de facto Jewish government before the State of Israel was established. And he was one of the signers on the Declaration of Independence when the State of Israel was established. Okay, and then from there, your father actually, he was the general. My father was, yes, my father was, my, both my parents were born in Palestine. So they were the first generation Israelis, if you will, first generation Jews who were born there. Um, and my father, as a young man, while still in high school, joined the Zionist militia. He became an officer. So in, in the, the war of 1948, uh, when the Zionists occupied uh, most of Palestine, he was an officer already. And then he remained in the military as a career officer. And by 1967, he was already a general mm -hmm. and, and a member of the Israeli Central Command, the High Command. Now, something happened in your life, something very sad and tragic that your niece, she was killed by a suicide bomber, is that right? That's right. Well, my sister came out when she came out and started talking to people and answering questions because there was a lot of press. It was big news in Israel. In fact, it was big news everywhere, a lot in, all over the world because she was a granddaughter of a famous general. In terms of responsible, both she and her husband said, we hold the Israeli government responsible for our daughter's death because when you maintain such a brutal oppression and a brutal occupation against another nation, when you take away people's land and you destroy their homes, when you incarcerate their fathers and quite often their mothers, uh, when you shoot their brothers and sisters in, the, in their school, in the schoolyards, this is what we get. This is the price that you pay as, as, a, as a society that maintains such a brutal oppression and occupation against another people. There's a price to be paid and this is the price that we pay and therefore they both felt um, that uh, they both held the Israeli government responsible because the Israeli government is responsible for the reality that exists there. Now someone just said that's an anti-Semitic statement you just made. Somebody's pointing the finger and say this guy's anti-Semitic. What do you have to say about that? Well, I'm Jewish, so being anti-Semitic is nonsense. <laughs> yeah. Number one. Number two, being anti-Semitic means being racist against Jews. I'm not racist against Jews. Um, but I am critical of the state of Israel. I'm critical of Zionism, which has really nothing to do with Jews. Um, although they claim to. So there's nothing anti-Semitic about criticizing Israel. In fact, most Jews don't even live there. Uh, most Jews never accepted Zionism. So I don't think there's, the, the, that has anything to do with it. And it's a claim that's being thrown out when there's nothing else to say. 
when the other side, the pro-Israeli side, the side that supports the violence in Palestine uh, has nothing to say, they say anti-Semitic. Well, so they say anti-Semitic. What if uh, someone says, look, you, he's just a self-hating Jew. Have you heard this statement? Yeah, well, I certainly don't hate myself. <laughs> so that's nonsense. <laughs> yeah. And I don't hate anybody else. I think it's, again, it's one of those things they throw at you when, they're, when they've got no argument. I just had a, a, a rabbi um, give me an analogy. He said, look, imagine you left your home and then someone came and occupied it and then you try to get it back and then they went to the judge. Have you heard some of these analogies? Maybe you can... You can yeah, I, that's assuming that, you know, that's, that's, that's taking it into a place which I, I don't usually go. That's making the assumption that today's Jews are really the descendants of the ancient Hebrews that used to live in that part of the world some 3,000 years ago. That's making the assumption that today's Jews are really the descendants of the ancient Hebrews that used to live in that part of the world some 3,000 years ago. That's a that's a that's a bit of a stretch for me um, mm. and even if it was true I don't think it uh, I, I agree with him it doesn't justify you know I did not live there 3,000 years ago my grandparents immigrated from 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 Ukraine their parents their grandparents didn't live there and I don't know any Jew that can trace his or her ancestors back to the ancient Hebrews you know I did not live there 3,000 years ago my grandparents immigrated from 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 Ukraine their parents, their grandparents didn't live there. And I don't know any Jew that can trace his or her ancestors back to the ancient Hebrews. So that's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of myth there. Um, and I don't think it's relevant. So that's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of myth there. Um, and I don't think it's relevant to the point. All right, so just wanted to go ahead and come to this uh, genealogical table of uh, the descendants or generations of Japheth. I know a lot of you don't feel this Bible stuff, uh, but we're just trying to make sense out of all these uh, people, you know, so we don't just hear, oh, it's a mystery where they originated. It's a mystery. You don't even know where the Greeks and all these people originated, right? But um, try to make sense of who their ancestors are, right? Uh, and see if biblically we can make this historical. All right, so we were just talking about well, we talked about the Ashkenazi Jews, right? Ashkenaz, uh, we got the pastor mentioning them. And also we read about, you know, how most of the Eastern European uh, Jews were Ashkenaz, right? So we know that Ashkenaz is actual person, all right? So, it, I mean, logically, we'll, like the pastor was saying and everybody and, and then the studies that they were saying that, you know, must be like they're descendant from this dude Ashkenaz who's actually son of Gomer and son of Japheth, so a grandson of Japheth, Ashkenaz. And it says here ancient names, Eregenius, Ashkesiniti, Sakai, and it says eventually Japanese, you see that? Eventually the Japanese? <laughs> Alright, because that's, that's the hijack right there. But we got Togarma, we're going to read about Togarma as well. Alright, because we know already they already related that the Ashkenaz or the Ashkenazi Jews, right? are more Eastern European related to Turks and we know that Tugarma is the descendant or ancestor I mean of the Turkomans or the Turks all right Tugarma all right and these are all from Japheth so they're related these are from Japheth Magog and Gomer all right we even see uh, Madai Medes the little Russians Ukrainians or Rutinians we saw the commander's son right say that his dad came from Ukraine they've been there they're Ukrainians and now you see that these Ukrainians are Jafet as well all right now this is just a reference we're gonna go into all this and in other videos all right that I'm gonna be doing you know we're gonna try to put it all together but remember this presentation I'll try to reference it again so we can get this uh, going through our heads and try to link all these people up all right at least um, to a common uh, region or person you know or specific tribes you know that we can say well these were you know distant cousins right like, look, under Magog, we got the Scythians, the Tatars, the Huns, remember, that it told us that the Jews, the Eastern European Jews, the Ashkenazi, were actually more related to Huns than the ancient Israelites, all right? The Huns are from Japheth, too, all right, under Magog, 
All right. All right, I'm in the uh, Sondervan Pictorial Bible Dictionary by Meryl C. Tini. All right, this is the official one in the 60s. All right, we're going to go to page uh, 76. Uh, well, around page 76, let me see. All right, so actually page 77 of this book, and it says Ashkenaz, right? Ashkenaz, great-grandson of Noah through Japheth and Gomer, all right? And this is the Bible verses. It says a tribe or nation mentioned once. In Jeremiah 51, 27, associated with the Ararat and Mini as an instrument of wrath in the hands of God against Babylon. They fought for the Most High, you know. And so again, a tribe or a nation, a tribe, a nation. He has a nation, Ashkenaz. All right, he had a nation. Where's their descendants? All right. All right, we're page, uh, let me see, 402. And we're under Japheth now. All right. Says God will enlarge. That's what it means. Says a son of Noah. He was older than Shem, but comes third in some list of the three sons. Shem, however, is usually named first. Japheth and his wife were saved in the ark. He aided Shem in covering the naked body of their drunken father. He is the progenitor of the more remote northern peoples of southeastern Europe. All right, ancestor what? Of who? Southeastern Europe's right. Ashkenazi Jews, these Khazars, all these Turks right mongols that he was to occupy the tents of shem is thought to refer to conquest of the greeks who were descendants of japheth all right the greeks are descendants of japheth all right greeks you know the greeks are black right we saw um medicine man's video the ancient ancient greeks were black all right so even japheth was black it wasn't always about white all right this he did during the days of assyrian power he had seven sons whose descendants occupied the isles of the Gentiles, Hellenes or Greeks, an area including Asia Minor and Upper Greece. All right. That's Japheth right there. All right. You say it's only... All right. We're in this uh, book now. Let me just uh, zoom in. It says the Khazars in Annotated Bibliography by Bernard D. Wainrib. This is in Studies in Bibliography and Book Lore, Volume 11, Number 1 and 2. All right. From... The Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion. All right. And this is the article we're going to read. It says, um, this by bibliography is based on the same principles as its predecessor, which appeared more than a decade ago. The annotations of the items are designed to indicate similar angles, such as the beginning and destruction of the Khazar state, eventual continuation after the 10th century conversion, problems of migration westward, and the origin of Eastern European Jewry. But this time, the emphasis is also on several additions, angles, additional angles, such as the visibility or lack of it in Jewish sources of the connection between the Khazars and Judaism or Jews. The application of the history of the Khazars today to today's political purposes and its combination with anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish or anti-Israeli tendencies. The first of these angles is already found in Josephine's genealogical table, 9th or 10th century, which depicts the Khazars as descendants of Togarma, a grandson of Noah's son, Japheth. All right, so let's go back to that table we had earlier. All right, so Togarma, right? Togarma right here. All right, Togarma. The Khazars come out of this person, it says, supposedly the Khazars, Togarma from Gomer and Japheth. All right. Without mentioning that they, at least some of them, had any connection with Judaism. It is carried over into later centuries, for example, by two 12th century Jewish travelers, Benjamin of Tudela and Petachia of Riesenberg. Bibliography, uh, and as the number says, and Ish Shak Abramanel, Commentary of Ezekiel, chapter 38, which by implication counts the Khazars among the people who will come with Gog to fight the Jews in the land of Israel and perish there. You see that? They will come with Gog, the Khazars, man, this confederate. Who's the Khazars? See why they ain't mentioning the Khazars or want to be connected to these Khazars? All right. Among the people who will come with Gog to fight the Jews in the land of Israel and perish there. This written in 1493 indicates that he regards the Khazars as anti-Jewish Gentiles. And then right here got a couple of sources. It says here by uh, Marcus Nathan Adler, the itinerary of Benjamin of Tudela says the southern provinces of Russia were spoken of as the land of the Khazars 
especially by Jewish writers, long after the Russian conquest about the year 1000, and the Crimea was known to European travelers as Kasaria. All right. Um, on this side, it says uh, Naji Aluj Al Masira Ila Palestine. Says the journey to Palestine, 1964. It says there were 10 million Jewish Khazars. Thus, the Jews of Eastern Europe, who were the most Zionistic, did not originate in the Kingdom of Judah and were not Semites. It says here by Menachem Amelander, Ben Solomon Halevi. All right, it says first edition, Jiddish Amsterdam, 1741. And then it says new edition, translation into Hebrew by Harim Homer in Jerusalem in 1964. I remember the quoting sources here. It says Jehuda Halevi translated the Zephyr Hakusari from the Khazar language. According to Arab authors, Khazar, or Khazar, right, was the son of Japhet, or a son, a descendant of Japhet, the son of Noah. Khazar separated from his brothers after they left the Ark, and he came to the river Volga, building a large city there, which he called al Khazar. These people who lived on the north side of the Caspian Sea are also called Khazars, since they joined the Khazar nation. At first, the Khazar king leaned toward the Karaite form of Judaism until Rabbi Judah al-Nagari Naga, Nagari, explained to him that this is not the real Judaism. He then converted to traditional Judaism and according to the teachings of our rabbis, over 100,000 people converted to Judaism. You see that? They converts. All right. All right, we got another source here. It says Baraz GM uh, Dreneshiv Erisko Kasaro Ruski. All right, he got a very long name. All right, the oldest Jewish Kesar Russian legal monument, the legal code for people in Sobrani Trudovpo Bopruso. All right, that's Russian. All right, right there again. It says collected works on the problem of the Jewish element in the monuments of old Russian literature, volume one. Is from 1927 and it says insofar as the slavic nations especially the bulgars were influenced by the old testament it was through the jewish khazars all right slavic nations jewish khazars khazars the converts the original legal code which was enforced in Kasaria, consisted of the religio civil code designed for the populace all right another source here says julian bartosiewicz uh, studia Historicini e Literaki, or Historical Literary Studies, Volume 2, from 1881. All right, this is the Khazars, where a people related to the Huns. All right, the Huns. The Khazar state was multi tribal, speaking a language which resembled that of the Volga Bulgars. The religion of the top rulers was Judaism, to which they changed from Islam. From what? From Islam. From what? From Islam. All right, you see the relation. You see where the relation is going, right? Confederate, you see what's going on here, right? We're going to get deeper into this as the videos go. All right. All right. We got another source here. It says uh, Bash Makov or Une Solution Novel de Problema de Caesars, Mercury de France. All right. Pages 39 and 73 says the Caesars' racial origin and the geographic position of their capital seems to confirm the information given in King Joseph's letter. Hmm, Got to get into that. It says here, John O. Betty, The Iron Curtain Over America, Dallas, 1951, Chapters 3 and 4, Russia and the Khazars, and the Khazars joined the Democratic Party. It says the author maintains that communism is the creation of Judaized Khazars in Russia, the Marxian program of drastic controls, so repugnant to the free Western mind was no obstacle to the acceptance by many Khazar Jews for the Babylonian Talmud under which they lived had taught them to accept authoritarian dictation on everything from their immorality to their trade practices. He also states that persons of Khazar background or tradition or of related origin or ideology are in high positions and influence in the American Democratic Party and the United States government and that they play leading roles in England and France. All right, it says here from uh, Jishak or Ishak Ben Sevi. All right, so from Tel Aviv from 1951. It says Jews came very early to the Crimea where they organized agriculture and urban settlements and took over the commerce between the Slavs and the Khazars, upon both of whom they exerted some influence. But it was mainly the Persian Jews, again, who was these Persian Jews who influenced the Khazar king, Bulan, and his top officials to convert to Judaism. 
in 732 or 740, the military and civilian elite were the first to become Jews, and later others followed in their footsteps. In the 9th and the beginning of the 10th century, when the Khazars conquered the Crimea, the local Crimean Jews integrated into Khazar Jewry. At the beginning of the 11th century, the Khazar state was definitely defeated by the Russian princes, losing its oldest center on the River Don, but continuing to rule in Dagestan, North, Northern Caucasus, and the Crimea. It has now become clear that something of the Jewish Khazar state existed up to the 13th century until the Mongol invasion. So-called Mongol, who's this? These hordes, the hordes, which is the ar Russian armies. Talking about Georgie, Genghis, aka Genghis. Okay, we got another source here. It says from Jivo Bladder, 13, from 1938, uh, pages 109 to 23. It says the native Crimean Jews, the Krim Chaki and the Karaites, have different blood types than the Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews, right? They're different. You see the Karaites, they ain't the same as these Ashkenazi. Because we learned about the Karaites and Prester John, right? Right? But they have a different blood type than the Ashkenazi and the Sephardic Jews. Their blood structure is close to that of the pure Turkic tribes from Jafet, right? And the Kyrgyz and the Uzbeks. This blood composition may possibly be connected with the Khazar origin. Right, we got another source here from Mohammed Isat uh, Darwaza. It says, Tariq Bani Israeli Min Asfarim. The History of the Children of Israel from their books, Volume 3, Cairo, 1960. It says the Khazars were the largest group to convert to Judaism, and they are known as Ashkenazism. What? The Khazars are known as Ashkenazism? They converted to Judaism? Another source here says Max Diamant and Arthur Praise, the Sharin Adieu. Oh, I can't read that. All right, and this is from the Judici Volskuns by Max Diamant in 1937. It says, before the immigration of Jews from Germany, remnants of the Khazars who had converted to Judaism in their Asiatic abodes came to Poland. So before they got to Poland or Germany, all right, Jews from Germany, right? They didn't originate there. They didn't just go from the Holy Land to Germany. All right, these were Khazars who converted to Judaism, all right, before they got there to Poland. Traces of their culture can be found in the Jewish art of Eastern Europe. All right, so I just wanted to show you some examples because actually, you know, this keeps going. There's actually a lot of uh, references, you know, I can keep going to the next pages, um, you know, and it'll keep, <laughs> it'll keep going, giving me references. That's what this article is about, this scholarly article, right? So we can go all day naming, talking about the case, but I just want to continue with the video. I just wanted you to get a clear understanding that this is a historical people, historical empire, and they didn't just vanish, all right? They didn't just vanish like they tell us, all right? All right, so just one quick source so you can see, you know, I'm just picking them at random. Here, I'm gonna go uh, zoom into this one. Hold on, let me just go uh, a little bit more in. All right, and it starts right here in the bottom it says, it's from uh, Julil Jasen, Historia Evrekrikosko Narodo Rossi, The History of the Jewish People in Russia, volume one. All right, and it goes right here. It says the Khazars came from Asia into South Russian steep, where they formed a number of urban settlements. In the eighth century, the Khazar king Kagan and his entourage embraced the Jewish religion. They embraced it. They converted. During the same century, they overpowered the Eastern Slavic tribes. A century later, they spread their rule over the whole territory between Northern Caucasus and the Kiev region. By 964 or thereabouts, the Kiev prince defeated the Khazars who soon disappeared. See, like I told you, they say they disappeared, but they actually went to Poland. There's a lot of different investigations, all right, that they actually settled in Poland. All right, like it says over here on this side, look, I didn't even read this, like Jewish settlements in Poland and Russia, all right? So they were around for about 300, 400 years. That's not a little bit, that was a lot. That was a big empire. They were controlling the trade and all that between Europe and Asia, all right? These Khazars. All right, so now we're in this uh, book. It's called The 13th Tribe, The Khazar Empire and Its Heritage by Arthur Kosler. All right, now it says, this book traces the history of the ancient Khazar Empire, a major but almost forgotten power in Eastern Europe, which in the Dark Ages became converted to Judaism. Khazaria was finally wiped out by the forces of Genghis Khan, 
but evidence indicates that the Khazars themselves migrated to Poland and formed the cradle of Western Jewry. So again, now we're seeing, so if these, now we heard that, you know, they're not the Hebrews from the ancient, you know, times from different sources already, right? He even got, uh, you know, the son of a, you know, one of the founding fathers of Israel, letting you know straight up. They're not the same people that lived there 3,000 years ago, even though it wasn't there. But in, anyways, they're letting us know in this book that there was a empire which was called the Khazar Empire. All right. A major but almost forgotten power in Eastern Europe. And it says that, you know, these people were not wiped out completely by Genghis Khan and these so called Mongols. We're talking about Genghis Khan. Is this really Georgi Danilovich, the original Russians? This is jo Judov. Judov. All right. So. In the way, they're saying that these Khazars were not wiped out completely. They actually migrated to Poland and formed the cradle of Western Jewelry. And the, and the, you know, the first rabbi we heard, he's letting you know, hey, man, these are Caucasian people. We're Caucasian people. You know, and then the second preacher, the guy, he's letting, the pastor, he's letting you know, these are white people. These are 80% European DNA. All right? These Khazars, all right? They're not even, you know. He's, he, he told us Ashkenazi, right? So this correlating with this book also. So it says the Khazar sway extended from the Black Sea to the Caspian, from the Caucasus to the Volga. And they were instrumental in stopping the Muslim onslaught against Byzantium, the eastern jaw of the gigantic pincer movement that in the West swept across Northern Africa and into Spain. So they were actually helping Europe not get invaded that much by Muslims or Arabs because they were kind of in the way, you know, to get to um, from Asia to Europe, you have to go through the Caucasus if you don't want to go to Africa and the Mediterranean. So, yeah, they were holding that down and they weren't letting nobody go by there. So they were kind of helping. They had an important role. All right. In the second part of this book, The Heritage, Mr. Coaster speculates about the ultimate faith of the Khazars and their impact on the racial composition and social heritage of modern Jewry. He produces a large body of meticulously detailed research in support of a theory that sounds all the more convincing for the restraint with which it is advanced. Yet, should this theory be confirmed, the term anti-Semitism would become void of meaning, since, as Mr. Kostler writes, it is based on a misapprehension shared by both the killers and their victims. The story of the Khazar Empire, as it slowly emerges from the past, begins to look like the most cruel hoax which history has ever perpetrated. All right, y'all did they're getting? Who are these Khazars today? Part one, rise and fall of the Khazars. Says here, about the time when Charlemagne was crowned emperor of the West, the eastern confines of Europe between the Caucasus and the Volga were ruled by a Jewish state known as the Khazar Empire. All right, so by the time of Charlemagne, this famous king, there was already a Jewish state known openly by everyone. The Khazar Empire was a Jewish state. All right, during the time of Charlemagne. At the peak of its power from the 7th to the 10th centuries AD, it played a significant part in shaping the destinies of medieval and consequently of modern Europe. All right, an important part, these, this Khazar Empire in modern Europe are a very important part in medieval and modern Europe. The Byzantine emperor and historian Constantine Porpiro Genitus must have been well aware of this when he recorded in his treatise on court protocol that letters addressed to the Pope in Rome and similarly those to Emperor of the West had a gold seal worth two solidi attached to them, whereas messages to the King of the Caesars displayed a seal worth three solidi and had more worth, they're saying. This was not flattery, but real politic. In the period with which we are concerned, wrote Buri, it is probable that the Khan of the Khazars was a little less important in view of the imperial foreign policy than Charles the Great and his successors. All right? So he had a very important role. He was respected just like Charles the Great. A few years later, probably AD 740, the king, his court, 
and the military ruling class embrace the Jewish faith. All right, this is it right here. How did they become Jews then in Hebrews? Cody Mayo says that in the year 740, the Khazar Empire, the king, right? His court, the military ruling class, they all embraced the Jewish faith and Judaism became the state religion of the Khazars. It became, it wasn't, it became. It's not a, it wasn't a heritage for them. It wasn't a race. It wasn't a people, a nation. It was a religion and it became the official faith. It became the state religion of the Khazars. They adopted it as a religion. No doubt their contemporaries were as astonished by this decision as modern scholars were when they came across the evidence in the Arab, Byzantine, Russian, and Hebrew sources. You understand? Modern scholars know this is a fact. It's in the Arab sources, right? The Byzantine sources, the Russian sources, and Hebrew sources. All right? Classical antique, antique sources. One of the most recent comments is to be found in a work by the Hungarian Marxist historian Dr. Antel Barta. His book on the Magyar society in the 8th and 9th centuries has several chapters on the Khazars, as during most of what of that period the Hungarians were ruled by them. Yet their conversion to Judaism is discussed in a single paragraph, with our investigations cannot go into problems pertaining to the history of ideas, but we must call the reader's attention to the matter of the Khazar kingdom state religion. It was the Jewish faith which became the official religion of the ruling strata of society. It became, needless to say, the acceptance of the Jewish faith as the state religion of an ethnically non-Jewish ethnically non-Jewish people or non-Hebrew people, non-Hebrew, they're not the Hebrews, could be the subject of interesting speculations. We shall, however, confine ourselves to the remark that this official convers conversion is defiance of Christian proselytizing by Byzantium, the Muslim influence from the East, and in spite of the political pressure of these two powers to a religion which had no support from any political power but was persecuted by nearly all, has come as a surprise to all historians concerned with the Khazars and cannot be considered as accidental, but must be regarded as a sign of the independent policy pursued by that kingdom. All right, so they weren't influenced by anybody. We got uh, before that the Persians were the ones who taught them this, uh, you know, Hebrew religion, uh, you know, and they adopted it from the Persians. Who were these Persians? Were these actually ancient, ancient Mayas or ancient pe people from America? You know, there's a lot of correlation to a Persian uh, culture and similarities that they found here when they went to Mesoamerica and they went to South America. So we're correlating all that. Where's the true old, you know, the true old world is here, but you know, where were these ancient lands really? Like we've been ancient Persia, ancient Babylon, all right? that a lot of those people really come from out of America and a lot of those tales really happen in America. All right, so did these people bring that influence over here to these people, to the Khazars from the Caucasus Mountains. All right, continues says, which leaves us only slightly more bewildered than before. Yet whereas the sources differ in minor detail, the major facts are beyond dispute. All right, so there's a fact. It's a fact that they converted. That's what he's saying. What is in dispute though, what is they're disputing, though, is the fate of the Jewish Khazars. What happened to these so-called Jewish Khazars after the destruction of their empire in the 12th or 13th century? On this problem, the sources are scanned, but various late medieval Khazar settlements are mentioned in the Crimea, in the Ukraine, in Hungary, Poland, and Lut Lutuania. Now, I, I believe that these countries have a large population of Jews, right? All right, so where is the Jewish Khazars? The general picture that emerges from these fragmentary pieces of information is that of a migration of Khazar tribes and communities into those regions of Eastern Europe, mainly Russia and Poland. So if people knew the term Hebrew, meaning one from the other side, and these people were not from there, these Khazars, and they would get there, wouldn't the local people call them Hebrews? meaning those immigrants, foreigners, immigrants, those from another region, could be, right? Now it says here, where at the dawn of the modern age, the greatest concentrations of Jews were found. All right, so Russia and Poland, 
right? They know the Khazar tribes ended up there, large communities of Khazar, and that's actually where the largest concentrations of Jews are found in Europe, Russia, and Poland. All right? This has led several historians to conjecture that a substantial part and perhaps the majority of Eastern Jews, the majority, remember the dude said 80% of the DNA, and hence of world jewelry, might be of Khazar and not Semitic origin. All right, the Eastern Jews. All right. And he let us know, remember before, that these are the same people that ended up founding the state of Israel, these Eastern Jews, who are actually might be more Khazar and not Semitic origin. They're not the Hebrews, not Semitic. The far-reaching implications of this hypothesis may explain the great caution exercised by historians in approaching this subject if they do not avoid it altogether. And honestly, I have been avoiding it. Again, disclaimer, right? Fair use. Do what you want with the info. I'm just reading books. Don't kill the messenger. Thus, in the 1973 edition of the Encyclopedia Judaica, the article Khazars is signed by Dunlop, but there's a separate section dealing with the Khazar Jews after the fall of the kingdom, signed by the editors, and written with the obvious intent to avoid upsetting believers in the dogma of the chosen race. Now, it says the Turkish-speaking Karaites, a fundamentalist Jewish sect, all right? Who are these Turkish-speaking Karaites? We're talking about the ancient ones, not the ones that we believe they are. All right, of Crimea, Poland, and elsewhere have affirmed the connection with the Khazars, which is perhaps confirmed by evidence from folklore and anthropology as well as language. There seems to be a considerable amount of evidence attesting to the continued presence in Europe of descendants of the Khazars. How important in quantitative terms is that presence? All right, so how important, how big of a presence he's saying, right? He's quoting other people here. But then now the author saying of this article or book saying, so how quantitative, how big is this, how important is this presence of the Caucasian sons of Japheth? All right, let's go back. So you might not be a K, you might actually be a Khazar. You might not be a Semitic origin. You're not Semitic. All right. So what are you then? Oh, okay, how important? Then that means that the that this presence of the sons of Japheth and the tents of Shem, what? Oh, we, oh, he's going biblical now. Because remember the Bible, right? In the story of the Bible says that the, the descendants of Japhet will dwell in the tents of Shem and they will serve them. All right. So, again, how important is quant in quantitative terms is the presence of the Caucasian sons of Japhet. Caucasian sons of Japhet. Remember the rabbi said, we're Caucasian. Remember, 80% European DNA in the tents of Shem. All right. Remember, they're not Semitic origin. One of the most radical propounders of the hypothesis concerning the Khazar's origin of Jewry is the professor of medieval Jewish history at Tel Aviv University, A.N. Poliak. His book, Kasaria, in Hebrew, was published in 1944 in Tel Aviv and a second edition in 1951. In his introduction, he writes the facts demand. All right, so source, you know, primary source for them, right? He's a Jewish history professor at Tel Aviv University. He wrote a book all right, saying a new approach both to the problem of the relations between the Khazar Jewry and other Jewish communities and to the question of how far we can go and regarding this Khazar Jewry as the nucleus of the large Jewish settlement in Eastern Europe. All right, the descendants of this settlement, those who stayed where they were, those who emigrated to the United States and to other countries and those who went to Israel in the state of Israel, constitute now the large majority of world jewelry, all right? Letting you know this professor in 1944 book he wrote, right? That the Khazar Jewries or these Jewish Khazars, right? Basically either stayed there, all right? Emigrated to the United States and other countries and or went into Israel. And they are the large majority of world jewelry today. All right, they are the nucleus of this Jewish settlement in Europe, the Khazars. He's letting you know, this professor. This was written before the full extent of the Holocaust was known. But that does not alter the fact that the large majority of surviving Jews in the world is of Eastern European, and thus perhaps mainly of Khazar origin. If so, this would mean that their ancestors came not from the Jordan, 
but from the Volga, okay? Not from Canaan, not from America, but from the Caucasus, once believed to be the cradle of the Aryan race, and that genetically they are more closely related to the Hun. All right, the Hun. We're going to see these people related to Mongols, that are related to Turks earlier, the Turkish speaking Karaites. What's going on here? All right. Is there a confederacy here? I smell a confederacy. All right, so they're mostly related to the Hun, Uyghur, and Magyar tribes, then to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're not related. They're not descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Should this turn out to be the case, then the term anti-Semitism would become void of meaning based on mis misapprehension shared by both the killers and their victims. The story of the Khazar Empire, as it slowly emerges from the past, begins to look like the most cruel hoax which history has ever perpetrated. All right, so this book has a lot of uh, information and history on the Khazar Empire, the wars they had, the people that were around, influencing them, their whole history, how they converted, and where the sources are, what the sources are. He has a lot of footnotes, all right? So he has a, an appendix part where you can go check the sources. But basically, he points out the main sources of ancient times that state, you know, their conversion and everything. All right, and so uh, we're going to get into this book a lot when we start dealing with videos that I'm going to be doing regarding genealogies of the nations. Try to at least try to see if we can try to figure out some of them, see who they uh, descend to, like where did the Greeks come from, where the Romans come from, you know, things like that. And so right now we're dealing with the Khazars, right? And um, again, this is part two of the heritage, you know, just a, a quick sample again. Because we're going to be talking about Mongols and, you know, who are the real Mongols, who are the real Russians and all this stuff, right? It says here, Exodus, part five. So we skipped a lot, right? We went all the way to part five. It says the evidence quoted in the previous pages indicates that, it con that contrary to the traditional view held by 19th century historians, the Khazars, after defeat by the Russians, the Russos, the Mongols, in 965, because they got defeated by Genghis Khan, lost their empire but retained their independence with narrow frontiers in their Judaic faith well into the 13th century. Remember, they converted, so it was a religion to them. They even seem to have reverted to some extent to their eastward wild predatory habits, barren comments. In general, the reduced Khazar kingdom per persevered. It waged more or less effective defense against all foes until the middle of the 13th century, when it fell victim to the great Mongol invasion, so-called Mongol, Mongol means great, the great empire invasion, set in motion by Genghis Khan. All right, so they got defeated by Russia. They got invaded by Mongols. We're talking about the same people. All right, future video, we're going to put all this together. That's why I wanted to get into this. Even then, it resisted stubbornly until the surrender of all its neighbors. Its population was largely absorbed by the Golden Horde. Who's the Golden Horde? I'm talking about so-called mongols we're just talking about russian the russian army all right we're going to get into who the golden horde really is and where was its main epicenter all right where was its main epicenter all right and what does it have to do with batu khan and the vatican where is the golden horde capital all right so again this population of the khazars was largely absorbed by who Golden Horde, so-called Mongols, the Russian armies, which had established the center of its empire in Khazar territory. But before and after the Mongol upheaval, the Khazar sent many offshots into the subdued Slavonic lands, help, helping ultimately to build up the great Jewish centers of the Eastern Europe. All right, he got the sources for that. So a lot of them had already bounced the Khazars before they even got invaded. And they had already had large so-called Jewish centers. Because remember, they converted. All right. And they became the Eastern Jews. Here then, we have the cradle of numerically strongest and culturally dominant part of modern Jewry. The offshots to which Baron refers were indeed branching out long before the destruction of the Khazar state by the Mongols. As the ancient Hebrew nation had started branching into the diaspora long before the destruction of Jerusalem. Ethnically, the Semitic tribes on the waters of the Jordan and the turco khazar tribes on the Volga were, of course, miles apart, right? They're not the same people. 
ethnically they're not they're miles apart these are different people but they had at least two important formative factors in common each lived at a focal junction where the great trade routes connecting east and west north and south intersect a circumstance which predisposed them to become nations of traders of enterprising travelers or rootless cosmopolitans all right so these kazars that's why you see them into all these little business right running businesses money all right selling trading you see because they were in the middle of this place so it's just like in america you're talking about like central america mesoamerica that's like in between two like south america and north america right connects both all right it says here, um, as hostile propaganda has unaffectionately labeled them, all right? So, rulers, cosmopolitans, right? So, but at the same time, their exclusive religion for us fostered a tendency to keep to themselves and stick together, to establish their own communities with their own places of worship, schools, residential quarters, and ghettos, originally self-imposed, originally self-imposed. They created their own ghettos. They wanted the ghettos in whatever town or country they settled. This rare combination of wanderlust and ghetto mentality. <laughs> this is old school. They're not talking about what we think is ghetto. They're talking about the old school ghetto from them. That ghetto mentality. Reinforced by messianic hopes and chosen race pride. Chosen. They wanted to be the chosen race. All right. That's what he's saying. Pride. Both ancient Israelites and medieval Khazars shared. All right. So they both were like kind of pleading the same thing. He's saying. Even though the latter trace their descent not to Shem but to Japheth alright even though they're not even Hebrew they had the same kind of uh, aspirations and kind of beliefs even though they weren't them they were just practicing the religion the faith part alright so it continues so we're going to end it here I didn't want to make this video too long just what a little preview of what we're going to be getting into alright